Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Henry Spassi, and I'm the research associate for the Promise Neighborhoods Institute at PolicyLink and the lead for our community of practice. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to join us today. Today's webinar is focused on strategies to build out an effective case management system. We are joined by Mary Bogle, Senior Research Associate with the Urban Institute, Tara Watford, Director of Research and Evaluation with the Youth Policy Institute, Karen Scott, and Karen Scott, Research Director of the Indianola Promise Community. As we know, case management data are a critical tool to track, measure, and improve a program's performance, to ensure shared accountability across staff and partners, and ultimately to determine whether a respective strategy is likely to achieve population level results, which is what we're truly aiming for. In fact, data use is one of the key conditions for achieving the Promise Neighborhoods vision. As you use data to improve outcomes in your communities, I encourage you to check out a developmental pathway for achieving Promise Neighborhoods results. I've um, given you a highlight here on the slide, as you can see. This resource explains the critical developmental milestones for implementing and tracking progress towards collective impact by using the Promise Neighborhoods vision. It also provides a visual representation of developmental stages such as planning, early implementation, reaching scale, and sustaining results, all couched under the seven conditions that are necessary for the achievement of Promise Neighborhoods results. And as I mentioned, data use is one of those conditions. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. I would just want to encourage you um, and also say that this resource, along with other really helpful tools, are available on our website's resource library. Given this, the goal for today's webinar is that all participants learn key strategies to embed a results-based accountability framework into an effective case management system and to build out an effective case management system to track performance, course correct, and improve outcomes over time. If you have a question or comment at any point before, during, or after the presentation, please either type your question into the chat box or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. I will keep track of those questions and comments and then pose them to Mary, Tara, and Karen at the end of the presentation. I also want to mention that if you're dialing in via phone, please remember to dial the audio code so that we will be able to unmute you and hear you if you have a question or comment. I will also be sending out a survey at the end of this webinar to ensure that we're offering content that is helpful to you and to your work. Please take a moment to complete it. And with that said, I'm going to hand things off to Mary, uh, who will be providing a really great uh, in illustration to you of case management data. But before that, Mary would like to say a few introductory words. Mary? Hi, all. Uh, as Henry said, just uh, introduce me as I am Mary Bogle, and I am a senior member of the Urban Institute Promise Neighborhoods Data Technical Assistance Team. I also uh, happen to have a background way back in my past as a clinical social worker and have done lots of work with uh, Promise Neighborhoods and community change initiatives, um, even designing uh, some of them. So this is a near and dear topic to my heart because I think using case, case management data uh, is a really important way to drive the work on the ground forward effectively. Um, what My work today uh, is easy because we're going to show you a video. You're going to be the first to see this new video. Um, see, it's sort of scrolling by right now. Um, but um, it's based on a brief that uh, Sarah Gillespie and Chris Hayes and I here at the Institute wrote recently called Continually Improving Promise Neighborhoods, the Role of Case Management Data. You can find that on the Urban Institute website if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, it is uh, the purpose of this video, and it makes this is why it makes a nice overview piece for today, is that it's really a much more sort of accessible, chunk-sized uh, way into the topic for comprehensive community change initiatives in general. So you'll see that the first two slides really are aimed at a broader audience than Promise Neighborhoods, and then we talk about Promise Neighborhoods, because you we're assuming you guys are even more sophisticated than most on this topic. Uh, so, when you hear the video, you'll hear Sarah's voice. Again, my job's easy because it, even Sarah's voice is the one recorded on the video. Uh, please forgive any pops or sound issues. We have to re-record the sound. One of the last things we're going to do before we put the video itself on the Urban website is re-record the sound. I think the sound's okay. 
uh, right now, but just in case you're wondering, uh, you might hear a few pops and things. Um, one thing I want to note before the video begins is that about nine slides into this presentation, you're going to see some slides that are titled Who, What, and So What. Um, and these slides discuss which, uh, a few indicators uh, which you are generally defined in Promise Neighborhood Results Frameworks and then also uh, collected in your case management systems typically. In these slides there are, you'll, tables will come up that have green bars at the top and that is titled Performance Management Questions. And I just wanted to point out um, before we move into the presentation that those are drawn directly from Mark Friedman's uh, results-based accountability model. So you might want to have a heads up because I think that's going to help you uh, wrap your minds around RBA using this presentation uh, so that when we get to Tara's uh, piece of the presentation, I know she's going to go a bit deeper on results-based accountability and its use for uh, frame as a framework in a case management system. So I just wanted to frame that. We don't use the term results-based accountability in this piece because, again, uh, like I said, we're trying to keep it very accessible. Uh, but just a heads up to this group that that's what's going on in those slides is there's a lot of RBA represented particularly in those slides. So uh, let her roll, Henrissa. I'm ready. Okay, great. And I'll be back with Q&A. <laughs> okay, I think the volume needs to go up. Community level data, 
CCIs take responsibility for achieving results for the entire community population, even for those people they may never serve directly. This is called population accountability. However, changes at the population level usually take longer, and individual strategies that may be working really well or not working at all can sometimes be obscured by larger trends or events in the local economy or school system. In our transportation example, population accountability means that everyone should be able to get where they need to go safely and on time, regardless of whether they are riding a bus to school, driving their car to work, or walking to the store. Case management data are uniquely powerful because they are linked to individual people or families, rather than to groups of people like entire schools or neighborhoods. This allows a CCI's performance managers, such as the data manager, program manager, or board member, to understand the outcomes the CCI is achieving for the people it serves most directly through strategies like tutoring programs, mentor assignments, or home buyer clubs. This is called performance accountability. In our example, if a school bus isn't picking up the children who are going to school or isn't making the right turns to get to school, then the school bus isn't doing its job. Performance managers who look closely at case management data will have much better evidence to drive decisions on which strategies to expand, change, or stop altogether in order to stay true to the CCI's theory of change and desired results. In our example, these data would help us understand which kids are riding the bus and whether we have too many or too few buses for getting all kids to school. The keys to linking the results framework to the case management cycle are collecting the right case management data and asking the right performance measurement questions. These data and questions fall into three main categories, who, what, and so what. The next few slides provide a collection of data and questions the CCI should be examining in each of these categories. The first category is who are we reaching? In the results framework, this question is examined at the population level by identifying a target population and understanding the needs of different segments of that population, such as children under five, high school students, children of color, or households living in poverty. In the case management system, data are collected on individual participants that document things like where they live, age, race and ethnicity, and family composition. Performance managers can use these case management data to understand whether a CCI is staying true to its results framework based on who it serves. For example, if the results framework identified households with children under five as a particularly important target population to serve, Performance managers should use case management data to ask, are we enrolling children and families who can most benefit from our programs? The second category is, what are we providing? In the results framework, this question is examined at the population level by identifying a continuum of solutions and evidence-based strategies that will achieve the results a CCI seeks and the partners who can deliver those strategies. In the case management system, data are collected on individual programs and participants that document things like the types of services provided, the amount or dosage of services each participant receives, and when each participant attends or exits services. Performance managers can use these case management data to understand whether a CCI is staying true to its results framework based on what it's providing. For example, if the results framework identified home visiting as an important solution to provide households with children under five, performance managers should use case management data to ask how many households with children under five are receiving home visiting, and are those households receiving as many hours or days of home visiting as we would expect? The third category is, so what? Is anyone better off? In the results framework, this question is examined at the population level by annually measuring the population level indicators the CCI expects to improve by serving the population with the identified strategies. In the case management system, data are collected on individual participants that document the outcomes for each participant directly served by programs or strategies. These data are collected through program assessments, pre-post tests, observations, or other methods. 
Performance managers can use these case management data to understand whether a CCI is staying true to its results framework based on what it's achieving for participants. For example, if the results framework identified kindergarten readiness as an indicator of progress toward their results, performance managers should use case management data to ask how many children who received home visiting were ready for kindergarten and why were some children who received home visiting more ready for kindergarten than others? Did a particular partner or a particular type of family have better outcomes? Let's look at two of those performance management questions in an example. Suppose a CCI's results framework has identified home visiting as a strategy to improve kindergarten readiness in the community. The CCI has two partners implementing the same 10-week evidence-based home visiting model. When the performance manager looks at case management data for families who participate in either of the home visiting programs, a simple comparison shows that 95% of children in Partner A's program are ready for kindergarten, and 68% of children in Partner B's program are ready for kindergarten. Based on the same school district's assessment, all children take at the start of kindergarten. At first, these data might suggest that Partner A is doing a better job than Partner B of providing a service that achieves outcomes for children. Going back to our transportation example, we could say that School Bus A is successfully getting more kids to school than School Bus B. However, if the CCI continues to examine the case management data, it could examine who each program serves and whether a particular type of family tends to have better outcomes from the home visiting programs provided by the CCI. When the performance manager looks at case management data for families who participate in either of the home visiting programs, the data show that Partner B is serving far more families who have a young single parent under the age of 25. Because the CCI knows this is a higher need population, these families are expected to require more services in order to achieve the results desired for all families. In our transportation example, we could say that School Bus B picks up children further from school and has a longer route to take with heavier traffic, so we would expect it would take more time and resources for School Bus B to get all of its children to school. With these data in hand, performance managers have an opportunity for further discussion with CCI partners about refining their home visiting strategy. Perhaps by designing a way to offer more intensive home visiting services, specifically for families with young single parents. Additionally, the CCI has the opportunity to maximize cost effectiveness by working with partners to implement the more intensive and therefore more expensive model only with families who need it, reserving the less intensive model for families who are more likely to succeed with the lighter intervention. In our school bus example, we could say a data-driven solution might be to double the number of buses that pick up children who live further from school so that those children can get to school around the same time as the children who live closer to school and can ride the same bus. It's safe to say that any CCI that only examines data at the population level is going to miss an important opportunity to figure out what's working and for whom it's working likely stalling progress toward desired results. As in the case of our transportation example, without these data, we may never have known that there were too few buses for children who live further from school, and that was keeping all children from getting to school on time. When based on a strong theory of change and results framework, case management data can often serve as the headlights to light the way along a road that other data sources may leave in the dark. If you'd like to learn more about using case management data for the continuous improvement of community change initiatives, click the link on this slide to access the full research brief or contact one of the authors. Okay, so that is um, the uh, video. I hope you all liked it. It's hot off the presses. Like I said, this is a, a big reveal and that you all are seeing it uh, among the first. We also took it on uh, a really beta test on some uh, Promise Neighborhood TA site visits uh, last uh, in the last few weeks, and I believe it's going out to LA with Sarah this week. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to be back. I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Tara now. I'll be back to uh, answer any Q and A and uh, contribute to the discussion. So Tara, on to you. 
And I'm just queuing up your slides, Tara. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Tara Wofford at the Youth Policy Institute. And it was nice to hear Sarah's voice there because Sarah is actually here visiting today on our first site visit. So she just walked by my office and I could point her to the video, which is really nice. Um, so I, um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, I think is a nice transition um, from that overview, is that we, when we talk about our case management system at YPI, I think um, when we've talked about our experiences, one of the big pieces is that we feel like you know, the lessons learned that we wish we would have known if we were starting over again is really um, what you need to think of before you start building your case management system and thinking about all the data that you're going to be looking at and how you're going to look at it. Um, I think uh, as uh, these, these nice frameworks come out, like the Promise Neighborhood, that have many outcomes that you're tracking, once you start doing this, there is the urgency, or at least there was with us when we started out, to really kind of build the system, get the system building fast, because we knew there was going to be all this data to come. Um, and uh, I think our lesson learned was really to be building the system in correlation with how uh, the programs were thinking and running. And so that's really what I'm going to focus on today, is our lessons learned of what you kind of need to know if you're starting out um, with case management system and really thinking about data accountability is what we call it here at Youth uh, Policy Institute. And so that's what I'm going to. Um, so I just can go ahead into the next slide. And so just a really, just a little brief background on us. This is some of our data for some of our schools. Youth Policy, Inst Youth Policy Institute is a large nonprofit in Los Angeles. Um, we have, we were working at like 125 sites, we have over 90 grants, and Promise Neighborhood is one of the grants that um, we are currently running. Um, we, for our Promise Neighborhood grant, we actually have two footprints. Uh, one of them, uh, and the, some of the data here, is in East Hollywood. Our East Hollywood is, um, footprint is large, it's about 58, over 58,000 folks. Um, 56% of those uh, residents are in poverty and 73% of the children are. Um, and then what's interesting about both of our communities is over a third are not born in the U.S. Um, and so you see some of the multiple data. We run uh, across our two footprints. We have 18 schools, um, a mixture of both district schools, public district schools, and charter schools. You can go to the next slide. Yes. And this is just a little bit of all the real snapshot data we collect. This is our other um, footprint, which is out in the valley. Um, and it's a little bit smaller. Uh, it's over 33,000 residents, um, but about around the same statistics, over a third are not born in the U.S., um, over a 50% poverty rate, and um, over 60% of the children live in poverty. So with 18 schools, we have a lot of data. We receive a lot of data. This Just this year, we received just from our um, public school district uh, partnerships. Um, we received over 25,000 individual data variables and data points on students. Um, so the push for us really was as soon as we got the grant to start building our data system. Um, and we worked a little bit independently from programs as they were starting and really thinking about all, their, all of their strategies and working out their strategies. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So what I want to talk about is kind of the three areas of, um, three, three large areas of what to think about as you're starting to um, build a case management system and thinking about case management and working with your data. And you can just put all of the Thank you, everything up on once. Um, so these are the areas I'm really going to talk about that I think were our learning lessons, that all of these components had to have to really work together and be aligned and run well. So I try to have the idea of them of cogs and wheels. So as again, so our research and evaluation staff focused a lot on the data system, and we had our program staff um, working on building the programs and designing the strategies. Um, and what we realized a year later is we had everything running, but they weren't all running as smoothly, and we hadn't joined them as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about the program alignment that needs to happen before the data system should really be um, thought through and a good vision program for that. 
And then also the staffing that's needed, because I think a lot of times um, folks underestimate the staff that it uh, takes and the um, skill sets that it takes to really have a good results-based accountability system running. So you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the first is, um, and you can go ahead and put all the bullet points up here too, thank you. Um, so this first is around program alignment, and what I mean about that is that um, before you build the data system out and thinking about what you're wanting to collect and all the components you're collecting, um, that there really needs to be a very strong, thorough look through of what your strategies are and how they are aligned to the outcomes that you want to get. So of course we had the initial sort of looking at the data, we looked at the outcomes that we were required to have for Promise Neighborhood, um, and we started working with our partners to build the strategies. Um, the one thing about this though is that we realized pretty quickly is that most of the outcomes are pretty long term for Promise Neighborhood. So some of the strategies at the beginning when we started working made sense to us that they would fit. So like some of our enrichment programs made sense that they would keep schools with that they would attract schools, excuse me, attract students and keep them in um, school so attendance rates may go up. Or that, you know, sometimes the enrichment, we even made the arguments that that would help graduation rates. Um, I think that we realized pretty quickly into the grant is that we needed to get more strategic because what we were doing was having lots of programs and collecting a lot of data. Um, and we weren't really clear on the vision of how everything was aligning together and working to push the, uh, the particular outcomes that we were prioritizing. Um, and, you know, from a, again, from sort of standing back a ways, these programs could be argued to have the results they were aiming for, but we knew we had a short amount of time and we needed to show some, some quick results fast. Um, so, and that sort of goes to the second bullet point of this notion of really being very clear of the, how uh, the program, what the programs you're doing, and then how that data that you're collecting around those programs are going to show progress. And I think one of the things that we did, and we had to go back and rethink this, was that we thought these programs were going to show, you know, in the, in the long term, show some of the outcomes, like graduation rates. Um, but we quickly, you know, when we ran that data and, and we're seeing that the, we couldn't see from our after school programs how that was affecting on these longer outcomes, we had to go back and think about where, what, what is the short term progress that we'd want to see um, and how we were going to measure that and then really de develop performance measures from there. Um, and that took some time and um, starting to run and then having to go back and sort of change things. Which, was, which is great and important and I think is a key step of that process. But because we were really large and our scale is large, we, we built out our data system sort of thinking along the, really not allowing us to be uh, as flexible as what we needed to be. Um, and we had to go back and think much more clearly of how we were connecting our performance measures to the longer outcomes. Um, and that, that piece is really what we realized was that our folks that were working on the data system side and our sort of re research and evaluation, putting the data together, putting the reports together, needed to have a lot more communication um, with those that were running uh, the programs and much more collaboration on how the two pieces of data analysis, data reporting were going to work with the staff and the programs and looking at their data and you know how they were going to make decisions based on that. So we can go to staffing. Um, so, oh well actually this, since that's here, there's, uh, that popped up and I didn't realize that was there. So one of the things that we did do to got a, what, what a, to course correct in some ways where we realized we were doing lots of things and maybe not all these things were going to be strategic enough to have the kind of outcomes we needed in a pretty short amount of time. We really started developing logic models. Um, and for all of our programs, we wanted to see, you know, the kind of outputs that we were having and then the short, um, the intermediate and the long-term effects. And most of the longer-term effects were what our core outcomes were for Promise Neighborhood, but we know we knew we needed to be able to track the much smaller baby steps to get there in order to really 
push our programs forward uh, to be successful at the end. Okay, now we can move forward. Thank you. So part of the big piece around, you know, how do we plan, how does our research and evaluation work closely with those on the ground that are running the programs, is that we, we had a moment here that we realized that moving to the more results-based accountability framework, we had to have, everyone had to have a responsibility around data. And I think that early on in the talks, we all knew that, we all agreed that that was the case, that's what we wanted, but there was still, because the research and evaluation team worked separately, would put things together like data walks, um, you know, would, would help gather all the numbers for reporting, um, it really kept being like there was these separate roles. Um, and because research and evaluation, that was kind of their roles and task, then um, they, they tended to talk about the data more in the meetings and the staffing meetings. And it just wasn't working where it is the program staff who really knew the program well and knew the kind of corrections and improvements that we'd want to be doing in program. They weren't being, able, they, because the research and evaluation team was working with data so much, it just, it didn't have an that it became a normal day-to-day -day practice of them looking at the data. Um, there was a sort of like codependent relationship going on between us and we decided at some point that we needed to break that down and that everyone had to have some more responsibility around data um, and understand about the data that they worked with, how, it, um, how that helped lead to the longer term outcomes. And what we actually did for this is we worked with different programs and we developed what we call the data accountability flowchart. Um, and so there were the multiple different levels of staff positions in that flowchart. Everything from at the very beginning, um, someone that was you know, working on site, um, on the ground in programs, and then they had, the next would be their supervisor, and then usually it was the next, which is the project manager or director, um, all the way up to the final piece was the executive team. Um, and so at each one of these levels, we actually broke down and made a checklist of the different things that each staffing level was responsible for in data. So for example, um, at a site level staff, it could be something as, you know, as basic as, you know, double checking the data that they enter, entering it on time, entering it regularly, so not, you know, there were, there were the deadlines that they couldn't wait for two weeks or three weeks um, to enter their data. Um, to running a basic report and understanding the data and, go, and reviewing their data with their managers to really understanding what's happening with their programs. And then the next level that their managers were responsible for um, checking monthly to see if their staff had been doing the data on time, um, talking to, about the data with their staff, and then the project managers, same sort of things up the line. Um, to, you know, were they making decisions based on it? How often were they talking about data? Um, what were the expectations of the quality of data they were doing and how were they checking on that? All the way up to the executive team and really around the executive team, we made it much more of, was, are we making sure that all the things to have data accountability on the long, uh, along the line, do we, were we making sure the resources were there so that everything had run smoothly? And so that was, that's been a very important step for us. Um, and so research and evaluation actually were just sort of streamed along all of those pieces of support instead of taking on the main role of, of um, reporting the data and reviewing it and presenting out about it. It much more is a supportive role and uh, the rest of the staff took on the role sort of onerous of um, knowing the data and making decisions by data. Um, the other really big piece that we did is that for a while we had different people working in programs. They were helping support build the data system um, and they were helping run the reports and the maintenance and all kinds of things and we decided at some point that the data system is pretty tricky um, and that we needed a team that was, uh, besides our just IT team, um, that was completely responsible for maintaining our data system, the build out, understanding it was their responsibility to understand the different programs, how they linked together and how they were integrated, and so what kind of reports would need to be done by that. And that was really important for us as well. So next slide. Okay, and then the final piece, and I put this last because those two other components really needed a lot of work done there and a vision before the system started being built out. 
Um, and I liked this cartoon because we felt like this in the moment because we were building at the same time. It was very much like we were building the you know plane while we were flying it. Um, so that it got, there wasn't a very clear vision in how all of our components were working in our system. And so we had to step back and really think about what, you know, look at our program, really talk to program staff to get that clear vision of how everything's integrating and what programs are linking to specific outcomes and how we're going to um, measure that and the, you know, the assumptions around the links. And then, and only then, to build out the system that way. Um, it's very hard to build, to go back, or it's inexpensive to go back and change the, um, the layout of your data system build out. So this vision and planning the vision first is really important. The other piece is um, because we're large, we kind of built large fat first um, and realized that that was a mistake as well. Um, it was much better um, to start very small with the system, pilot it, see how it's working, you know, learn your lessons, and then build from there. Um, and this goes, too, for like understanding the different types of reports that you want to run and analyze the data that you want to analyze, to think about that and to not build those kind of reports all along, um, but to start in a small area and then build from there. And we decided at some point that we were there were two areas that we thought we would have the most impact and have that sort of impact the fastest, and we had prioritized those, and so those became our, our pilot areas. And I think that's it. Thank you, and then I'm available to talk through any of the questions as well. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. That was, that was wonderful, and thank you, Mary. Um, so we're going to hand things off to Karen now. And Karen, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. That's because I was on mute. I apologize. Um, good afternoon. My name is Karen Scott, and I'm the research director for the Delta Health Alliance, which is the backbone agency for the Indianola Promise community. And Indianola is a rural town located in the Mississippi Delta. So similar to other Promise neighborhoods, IPC is building a pipeline of care to make sure that children are healthy and enter kindergarten ready to learn, and then that they continue to receive support once they reach school. We know that when this happens, that our students are way more likely to graduate from high school and go on to become productive adults. The pipeline is constructed through programs and services that build on and complement each other. The programs and services we have chosen are based on evidence of impact and appropriateness for our target population, which is 98% African-American youth. Um, our efforts are tracked frequently according to goals and performance measures that are developed before implementation. And the framework we use to approach this piece of the work is results-based accountability. And our case management system is the foundation of our results-based accountability or RBA work. At IPC, we have five steps for case management. The first is to lead with our framework, which is RBA. The next is to ensure quality data entry by providing training and support to our program and data entry staff. Um, we monitor program data quality um, by conducting monthly and quarterly data checks. We also monitor the program's performance um, through the development of goals and performance measures. And finally, we meet on a monthly basis as a team, both data staff and program staff, to discuss what's working, um, where are the gaps or concerns, and then develop action items and a timeline from next steps from there. So what does it mean to lead with our framework? Um, before implementation of any project, the data and program team meet to develop goals and performance measures as a team. Um, when we first started out, it was um, goals and performance measures were developed by the data team, and what we found was that there was a lack of um, ownership at the program level, um, and we were much less likely to be um, to receive quality, frequent data from our partners. Um, so we began um, developing these with um, program and data staff present. 
um, and then we build out a timeline for implementation and a, an accountability schedule. Um, after we know what the goals of the program are and how we will measure success, we determine what data needs to be collected, how often, by who, and by when it will be entered into the system. And we effectively develop what we call a data map that is shared with everyone on the team um, so that everyone is super clear on um, what their responsibilities are. After the data mapping process, that usually results in the development of an assessment or data calendar that includes specific responsibilities and deliverable dates. Um, we've, along with you know, developing these with our program staff, we found that by including the actual calendars in our legal agreements with partners, um, our partners are much more likely to follow through um, on agreed upon dates. Um, and it's a way to keep us both accountable to what we agreed to. Um, IPC conducts um, quarterly data quality checks to ensure data has been accurately entered by program and data entry staff. Um, our database administrators, they um, send out program-specific reports to um, program managers, and the reports usually highlight what the program is doing well, um, but more importantly, we um, highlight areas of concern um, where there's missing data or inconsistencies in the data. Um, and the project manager and the database administrator then develop a timeline to address concerns, depending on what they are. Um, and then the database administrators, um, administrators follow up um, on the timeline to ensure that um, the concerns are being addressed. Um, as an organization, we've um, identified several benefits from having the robust case management system um, we're now able to talk about what is not working, what is working um, on a frequent enough basis to course correct um, while the program's being implemented as opposed to waiting until the end of a school year or the end of a program term. Um, we're also able to talk about on a larger scale the impact of our collaborative at critical markers in a child's life. Um, and at this point, I was going to share an example of how we use um, our case management system to improve third grade reading. Um, so beginning in the 2014-2015 school year, all Mississippi third graders who attend public school were required to take and pass a literacy assessment in order to move on to the fourth grade. It's ominously known as the third grade reading gate. Um, that school year, IPC offered a number of support services um, we provided teacher coaching, home visitation, mentorship programs to third graders in Indianola. However, there was little co coordination between the services and very little communication with the school um, in terms of alignment to their curriculum and standards, as well as their school goals. So we got the results back um, in the spring of last year, and overall, our third graders performed pretty well. 80% um, of Indianola students passed the test on their first attempt, but when we limited it to just the most at-risk students, only about one in three passed the test on their first attempt. Um, and this is with the majority of our services being targeted at this population. So the results of the test highlighted the need for better coordination and case management um, because there's something we're missing. So last summer, um, the IPC partners, including the school district, began discussions on how to better serve the struggling readers in third grade. Um, we knew if we did the same thing we did last year, then we'd be crazy to expect different results um, and a better outcome for those students. So we knew we needed a, um, a new game plan with the goal of all third graders passing the assessment on their first attempt. Um, and to do this, we needed to be able to identify students who were most at risk of not passing and then better align IPC programs and services to school efforts in order to maximize impact. Um, and an important part of that was developing shared performance measures so that we could adjust um, as the school year was, was going on. So to develop the cut score, we used data from our case management system. We wanted to know if there was an association between the fall benchmark assessments, which um, are on the x-axis, um, if they could accurately predict the outcome on the reading gate, which is on the y-axis. Um, so what we found was that it could. 
um, and this allowed us to develop a meaningful cut score to, ident to identify students early on for intervention at the beginning of the third grade year, um, and that cut score, as you can see, was 200. So using that cut score and the data we collected at fall testing this year, we were able to identify students through our case management system. Um, we have demographic and contact information, and we recruited and enrolled them in our support services that we offer. So this image is a what we're calling a pipeline cross-section with those at-risk third graders in the middle. Um, following best practice and you know, better aligning to support classroom instruction, IPC hired four literacy fellows to work with um, the at-risk students during the school day for an hour each day. Um, the literacy fellows, along with the classroom instruction, provided um, the most intensive and direct intervention. Um, in, ad in addition to receiving the literacy intervention, all at-risk students were enrolled in our Lynx home visitation program and received a CARES mentor if they didn't already have one. Um, students were also targeted for enrollment in our after-school programs to provide additional instruction and remediation. IPC um, wanted to open up the communication between school and home, um, and so we used the case management system. Um, fellows and CARES mentors were able to um, leave notes for parents in the system that the links had access to, which are home visitors, and they were able to pass on this information to parents so that parents could understand where their children were struggling and be able to reinforce some of those practice and skills at home. Um, additionally, because this test is so high stakes, there were a lot of myths in the community surrounding the test and its importance. So we used our home visitors um, to better explain the, um, the reading gate law to parents so that they could better advocate, advocate for their own children. And we just received the results um, a couple weeks ago um, for the 2015-2016 first attempt. The percent of students who were, who were identified as at risk um, who passed the reading gate on their first attempt almost doubled from the year before. So last year, um, with less coordination and sort of piecemeal one-off programming, 36% of those students um, who scored below 200 passed the reading gate on their first attempt. And this year, 64% um, of those most at-risk students passed. Um, we're also now using this data, um, you know, these results in the case management model to plan for next year um, and possibly being able to expand the program for first, to, for first and second graders now that we know that it's an effective model for moving kids. And that's all. Great. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Tara and Mary. Um, I also want to mention that as soon as the, the link to the Urban Institute uh, video is made available, that we will go ahead and circulate that link. So now we're going to take questions. Uh, we, I see that we have a hand raised, and I'm going to go ahead and call on the person with their hand raised to see if you would like to speak. Um, Oh, looks like they put their hand down. Oh, wait, okay. Um, actually, no. So, Elaine Albertson. Hi, Elaine, is that you? Oh, um, okay, so I guess <laughs> Elaine put her hand down. Well, um, go ahead and type your questions into the chat box if you have any questions for our presenters. And um, it looks like Mary has a few comments that she would like to share on the presentation. Yeah, I just uh, let Henry know that I wanted to comment on, my, on the quality of my co-presenters' presentations because I was just really impressed with how both of them are thinking about this from, you know, slightly different places that I think are really helpful to the audience, and at least I'm hoping they are. Um, one of the things in our recent site visits uh, that came up a lot and had coming up this year, a lot of the promised neighborhoods that um, are requesting visits from urban want to talk about data sustainability. And what they mean by this is 
gee, if you know we don't get the continuation funds, we want to keep these systems going, and how do we keep the systems going? How do we you know keep partners entering data and participating with us? And I think both Tara and Karen just gave you a roadmap for it. Uh, I'll talk to you about uh, Tara's first, in that um, one of the, the you know two elements I really want to underscore, and we underscored in some of our conversations recently, is the importance of having a really clear theory of change. I mean, knowing, and we talk, Sarah and Chris and I talk about this in the brief. You really have to understand your overall theory of change, then create a results framework. And then drill down to the things that are most important, chunk out things that are most important for you to build out in your case management system. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the things that I think happens sometimes to comprehensive community change initiatives like Promise Neighborhoods is they get lost in big conversations that are kind of in the middle, uh, somewhere between the theory of change conversation that is the most exciting to have and chunking things out. And one way to chunk them out is to go to your partners and say, what is most useful to you? What is going to make you continue to participate in this system and find it useful? What data do you need? And then you can chunk that out and build it out in your case management system. Karen's presentation, I'll just say, I thought it was a almost picture perfect example of how you use um, data to, for real time feedback. Um, here they have, you know, these third grade results, use their data to take a de deeper nuanced look at them, come up with a new game plan for action because, you know, on the surface the data look good and then when they dug deeper, not so good, that goes with our little bus analogy in the video. Um, and so that, using that they were be better able to align the who they were going to serve with the what they were going to do and come up with the right performance measures to get to the so what. Is anyone better off? And I just, again, I, you know, kudos to both of them for coming up with what I think is really the right set of information, especially at this, this level of development. I mean, Promise Neighborhoods are in the, you know, middle, second half of their first five years. So there's all kinds of developmental issues with data. And uh, I think these were the perfect presentations uh, to put out there for folks who are thinking about what happens next in data sustainability. Those are my comments. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, great. So we have a few questions. Uh, this question is for both Tara and Karen. Um, does your case management system include many external partners or does it include only ex internal staff? So this is Tara. We do, we have about 30 partners. Um, so we have both internal programs that we run internally um, and we also have partners that we work with that bring in their data. Um, and then of course also our part of our partners are our school data that we bring in um, from the district and from our multiple charter schools. And I'll just ditto Tara, we have um, internal um, programs here at Delta Health Alliance and we have about 15 partners that also enter data into the case management system. Great, thank you. Um, this question is for Tara, you mentioned um, Having to decide which areas would give you quick and fast results, could you elaborate on how you how you knew or how you determined which areas would give you quick results fast? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, part of it is that we looked at so we're about a year and a half in, or maybe two years in, we looked at all of our work we were doing internally that we said were leading to the main outcomes plus our partners, um, and we realized that some of these things, uh, and I brought up enrichment programs because we realized we had a lot of partners that were doing things either after school or during school enrichment activities um, that we were that were great, but where you know there were certain areas that we felt like we didn't have enough strategic programs um, that were happening, and and one of the key ones was graduating high school in four years. And we felt like, hey, enrichment programs are great, but this is a five year. We need to see some outcomes within five years. Uh, we didn't think those were going to have as much of an impact, even though we liked them. And we had to make the hard decision of cutting those because we really wanted uh, the increase of high school graduation rates to be something that was a priority for us. Um, so instead, we started, um, we let go of a fair amount of those programs. And some of our internal programs we still do them, but we didn't we didn't uh, connect them 
or work with them um, as, as uh, closely. Um, and we started uh, deciding that we were having tutoring going on in the schools, but we decided to go out and find more funding for tutoring. We decided to get very strategic with which grades we were working with. Um, and um, work with the schools to learn who sort of really wasn't on track. Um, so that's that's just one example. Great, thank you. And for Karen, um, could you elaborate on how you aligned your school efforts for maximum impact using case management data? Sure. So. Um, Last summer, we started conversations with the school district as well as our partners who provide programming um, to third graders in Indianola. Um, and first, we just started off by bringing these partners into the same room. A lot of them had been having conversations with us during our monthly accountability meetings, but there was little to no conversation um, taking place between programs, um, especially within the school and then the programs that either take place um, outside of school or within the school with partners. Um, so we wanted to create a space where those partners could talk about um, communication issues, also talk about um, best practices and lessons learned that they've seen working with the same um, set of students. Um, and we thought that our case management system might be a good way to um, create a space for communication where it didn't always have to be in person. Um, so we developed, um, so we're working in efforts to outcomes, um, and we developed touch points, um, which are just um, little surveys and um, places where the people who are working with third graders directly could leave notes um, to others who are also working with their children. So for example, the um, literacy fellows worked with all of the children who were targeted at risk. And most of these students had a Lynx, which is a home visitor who visits with um, mom, dad, or grandma, whoever the guardian is, on a monthly um, to bi-monthly basis. And the fellows were able to um, talk about specific concerns for the child, um, if they thought that the child may benefit from having an eye exam because they were struggling to read. They were able to give that information directly to the links through the case management system, and the links took that information and was able to share it with the parent directly. Um, so that happened across most of the programs that served that target population during the last school year. Great, thank you. And um, I'll one last question before we close out. This is for both Kara and Karen. Could you speak to the largest barriers that uh, you encounter when building out your case management system and how you have addressed these barriers? We're waiting for each other to go. <laughs> <laughs> I can go first. Okay, go for uh, it. So I'd have to say our biggest barrier at the beginning was um, just getting information into the system um, and making sure our partners were entering quality data on a frequent enough basis that we could make decisions. Um, and the way we address that is um, we started, um, I mentioned this briefly during my presentation, but we um, meet with all of our partners on a monthly basis. Um, so we opened up communication and we're talking about these issues now on a frequent enough basis that we can address them early on so it doesn't become um, a systemic issue. Um, that was our biggest concern. And now that we're getting high quality data, um, it's just a matter of being able to share this back with them in a frequent enough way that it can be used for um, decision making. Um, whereas before, decisions weren't, weren't always rooted in data. Um, so that's where we are now. And um, we're rolling out um, what we're calling data coaching, um, where we're working with project managers and um, on-the-ground staff to use the data that they're collecting in real time to make decisions. Um, so this is Tara, and I would echo um, Karen. We, I would say we had two, two of our biggest challenges. Uh, our first was um, just the scale we're at, it took us a long time to get a data sharing agreement with our um, with Los Angeles School District. Um, and so really a big lesson learned was um, 
negotiating that very, very early in the game and just acknowledging that it may take a long time. And then once we did get the data, um, getting the data clean, like I said, we got 25,000 individuals and um, only uh, about 11,000 of those merged clean and easily. So we had to go through the rest individually. I mean, we learned a lot from that. So we made, you know, um, we made changes so that will go much smoother in the future. Um, and, and also with the charters, that charters the amount of data sometimes that we collected, it can be much harder for them. There might not be standard pieces or very, very few people in the school. So we've really learned that we need to support when we work with charters around um, data collection and data reporting. And the other piece is uh, what Karen mentioned as well, is just getting quality data entered. Um, which was a big sort of just cultural shift, really understanding that, again, it's not just all research and evaluations responsibility, like everybody in this, like everybody at every level needed to have a responsibility for, or, you know, making sure that whatever was being entered was quality um, and that there was checklists there for what needed to be. And we had to do, once we started doing that, we were also doing data coaching processes for making sure that the data is looked at um, for decision making, because we we started getting folks to be able to look at data and making sure they were entering it well, but then it was another process to really then you're looking at it, but how are you making meaning of it in relation to what you do? That's perfect. Um, thank you, and I think that's actually a perfect place to end. Um, so I want to say thank you again to all of our presenters. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I really hope that um, today's presentations were useful to you and to your work. And I'm going to send out the post-webinar survey. You should see it as soon as we close out. Please take a moment to uh, complete it. And uh, thank you to everyone again. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or any of our presenters. The contact information is up on the screen. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and close things out. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.